Good afternoon. I'm George Perkins. I'm the archivist for the McLean County Museum of History. And this past summer, we processed a largest collection we've ever processed. And we had two interns that are here today that did all the processing of this huge collection. They did a tremendous job and were very proud and pleased with the work that they did. And we'd like to tell you the story about the woman that is the main part of this collection. We had the two interns, uh, Denise Sampson, who is a junior at the University of Illinois, and Paul Rayburn, who is a senior at Illinois State University. What we're going to do is we're going to give a little story. They will be giving a little story on the timeline of Irene Delroy, who was actually born in Bloomington Normal as Josephine Sanders, and then went on to become a movie star and was in the Ziegfeld Follies and had a very interesting past and gave us a tremendous collection of over a thousand photos, many scrapbooks, 30 years of correspondence, and a wonderful, wonderful collection that we're really proud to have. And because of both of these interns, we have a wonderful inventory and finding aid for the entire collection. So I'll leave it to you. You may start with telling a little bit about the family. Um, the parents of Josephine Sanders were Della Sovereigns, who was born in Tazewell County, and Royal Sanders, who was born here in Bloomington, Illinois. Um, Royal taught at high school level um, after graduating from Illinois State and getting his law degree at Illinois Westland. He taught at Bloomington High School for a brief period and became a salesman of, he sold paint and also became a, an asbestos salesman. Um, Josephine, the daughter of Della and Royal Sanders, was born on July 21st, 1900 in Bloomington, Illinois. Uh, she also had a brother, Lindley, who uh, unfortunately died at the age of seven of scarlet fever. Uh, she attended Bloomington High School after her sophomore year, transferred to University High School, who was and was the prom date of Adelaide Stevenson II, in fact. Um, her career started at about age 18 when she traveled to Chicago to be in the Chicago Ballet. Uh, she spent about two years there, and after that, she moved on to various careers in the Follies, which were very popular at that time. Um, when she moved out east, she took the stage name Irene Delroy. Irene was kind of a, a name that she enjoyed, and Delroy was taken from her mother's name, Della, and her father's name, Royal, to create Delroy. Uh, she moved out to New York City, and her mother, Della, would follow her there. Um, she would spend the majority of her career um, through about 1931, traveling around with Josephine. Some of the plays of follies she appeared in were the Greenwich Village Follies, several years of that, the Ziegfeld Follies, more years of that, uh, Hitchy Coo, a golf musical called Follow Through, another musical called Here's How, and a musical that's still played today called Anything Goes. Anything Goes was performed on Broadway and is still performed today, as she said. Um, her her career in musicals sent her from New York to St. Louis, up to Canada and Vancouver, and out to the West Coast in San Francisco. Um, her mother and, and her mother and herself uh, traveled to Europe um, as a vacation, but she never performed out of the United States and Canada. Um, in 1927, she was named Queen of Musical and Comedy by a magazine, by the magazine The Daily Mirror, which we presume is out of New York City. While she was on stage, she was found by agents of Hollywood and she was signed on contract with Warner Brothers. And she made four movies with them in the span of a year called Oh Sailor Behave, Men of the Sky, Life of the Party, and Divorce Among Friends, which was her most successful movie. They still have a copy today in the archives of Divorce, Divorce Among Friends. Um, in 1929, her contract with Warner Brothers, um, the equivalent of what today would be $500,000 is what she signed on for for a, a period of four years. We'll talk about uh, her love interest. Uh, 
she was um, a very popular woman and made a lot of papers and was on the socialite list and had many suitors, including legendarily a man who was on the nation's 10 most wanted list. But she eventually married a man named William Austin, who was a wealthy New York realtor. Uh, she had a prenuptial agreement with him, and as a condition of her marriage, she had to void her contract with Warner Brothers and give up her movie career. And upon their marriage, she would gain uh, 25,000 shares of stock in his company called Rock Point Development. Uh, one question that we've considered through our research on Miss Irene Delroy is whether she uh, married for love or for money. Um, I guess I'll pose that question for you. I believe she married for love because she didn't gain anything out of this marriage. In fact, I'd say she lost quite a bit. So, um, Like she mentioned earlier, uh, Irene Delroy had many love interests um, that uh, many of which uh, her father, Royal, did not agree with. Her father, Royal, was a man who uh, was very opinionated. He was not a fan of uh, Jews, Catholics, Irishmen, and whenever Irene associated herself with any people of that nature, um, he would let her hear about it. But I have to believe that to give up what would be a $500,000 contract today, and I agree as well that she most likely married for love. I would like to talk about how that marriage went. <laughs> so they married in 1931. Um, the marriage didn't last very long. They separated a few years after that. And then they legally divorced in 1935. Um, at the time, divorce in New York where they were married was not, there was no no-fault divorce. She would have had to accuse him of um, beating her, and that wasn't true, and neither of them wanted to do that because they didn't have a lot of animosity towards each other from what I can gather. So she went to Reno for a while and established residency there so they could have a no-fault divorce. Um, after the divorce, um, Irene had aged a little bit and her career had pretty much ended with that five-year leave of absence. Uh, she did participate, like we said, in Anything Goes, which was in 1936, I believe. But after that, she did uh, small work in radio, she did commercial spots, and um, stepped in for different voice acting parts. Um, she volunteered at a veterans hospital at the end of World War II, and afterwards, um, she did small, small theater, I believe, after that. But after the late 1940s, she quieted down um, and moved out west, where uh, she would settle and became interested in, uh, I guess, the western scene, as you can see by the boots that we have here on display. Um, A lot of pictures. <laughs> yes. Um, her career would end in Ithaca, or I'm sorry, she would end up marrying uh, Dr. Gerard over in there. Uh, in 19, remarried in 1972, and she would live and die in Ithaca, New York in 1985. Um, so that is a short summation of the life and career of Josephine Sanders and Irene Delroy. Um, but let's talk about how we process this collection. So Denise, if you'd like to go first and tell us what you did and uh, or what the process was like. I primarily processed her photographs and her rather extensive legal and estate papers. Um, her photographs were over a thousand images. I'd say maybe 700 unique images. Um, it took quite a while to go through. At first I was just not able to identify anybody because of course no names are written on the back to speak of, but after a while I, I really started to know her and her family by sight, and I think I can identify them better than my own relatives now. Um, her legal papers were pretty interesting. She kept a lot of contracts, pretty much all of her contracts, a lot of leases for her apartments, so we know what she made and pretty much how she spent it. She kept all of her bank books. She kept um, all sorts of papers from her divorce. Um, her lawyer, during her dealing with her father, her father's estate, she was the co 
executrix with his uh, second wife, Dorothy. So her lawyer in that was uh, Adlai Stevenson II, back when he was a lawyer. So there's a long pile of letters between her and him discussing the estate, which is pretty interesting. Uh, would, she, would you say she kept an obscene amount of material? She did. Stories? She was a pack rat. Um, she kept way too many things. <laughs> Something that you wouldn't see today. No, I don't have old leases. Um, as far as what I did um, for the collection, I went through all of these scrapbooks. I think I believe we have seven scrapbooks. They span her career from her time in the opera ballet in Chicago all the way through her marriage in 1931. Um, and um, they have articles on their honeymoon which was covered um, in, in which she actually fell off her horse and uh, broke bones in her leg. Uh, they were calling that the end of her career but uh, I think it was really the marriage that brought Career. And then we also have articles um, from her work in the VA hospitals uh, after World War II. Um, we have original photographs. She subscribed to a clipping company, which pretty much anything that was published with her name in it, uh, she received. And, even, and what we most likely believe is her mother put these scrapbooks together. Um, I was also responsible for all the correspondence between Royal. Della, Irene, and close family members. Much of what we have is letters between Della, Josephine, and Royal, but we also have some from cousins. Um, but the majority of it, and I'd say, I don't know how many letters we had, but we had an entire box full of letters to sort through. Um, you really get to feel, you really get a sense of who, who you got to see Josephine or Irene. Uh, grow throughout her career as you read what she had to write, what she had to say, and you also saw the effect that the travels had on the family as well as the stress of having two parents be separated and having your daughter in the spotlight. You can definitely see where uh, it was stressful on everyone. Um, now we're going to also consider some other questions, or actually let's point out a, a few special items from the collection that we found interesting or unique. And we'll start with you. I have a ton of stuff. This was her first contract that she kept. It was with Chicago Ballet, and it was for a year. She made $18 a week <laughs> in 1918. And here is a carbon copy of her contract with Warner Brothers, which is compared to the Chicago one, which was a page. This is much longer. And it says that she made $1,500 for every week she filmed. And it says that it's for four years, so pretty good. Who is yours? Um, what I specialized in, well, my main focus of the correspondence was the relationship between Della and Royal. Um, you can feel the tension with um, the separation, her spending most of her time in New York and Royal being the salesman in central Illinois. So what we have, uh, something I find, by the way, I guess we both found interesting, as uh, she has made several notes on occasions that she's found um, Royal doing suspicious activities or has found women's belongings in his bags and traveling suitcases. Um, we have a suspected picture of perhaps his lover or... Found in his coat pocket. Yes, found in his coat pocket. Um, she, she suspected that he was cheating on her. Um, so much, or to, to an extent, that she hired a private investigator who, who uh, typed up a three-page um, report as he followed Royal around um, for about two weeks, um, discussing how he would meet women at a hotel or they would go for long drives. And uh, this was in 1925, so this was right in the middle of Della's absence out in New York. And um, the report comes back uh, that he believes that uh, Royal is having a relationship with someone other than Della. We, we even have a bill um, which came out to $223 as uh, he covered four days and also he, she paid for gas as well. Is there anything else? I have a ton of interesting pictures. Um, this is a picture.
picture of Eileen with her first co-star. His name is Tom Patricola. He was an Irish Catholic, so Doyle had interesting things to say on his character. Um, I believe that Josephine was sweet for him. They started in an act called The Dancing Fool. It's about all I know about him. This is a cool picture. It's from 1915, and it is Josephine here dancing at Wesley University Dancing Ballet at age 15. So that was way before she was famous. This is a picture of her and her brother, and their dad took this one. Their dad was an amateur photographer and did a lot of developing, and we have a lot of very interesting pictures in the collection that were taken by him and home developed their uh, sand types. And we have the glass plate negative of this photo. And Irene Delroy, I believe, was very devoted to her mother. And this is, in fact, a glamour shot of her with her mother, which I thought was interesting. Irene Delroy was on the cover of quite a few magazines, I'd say like seven, maybe. Uh, I picked this one. They're all like defunct magazines that she was on the cover of now. I thought this was a nice picture of her pretending to sunbathe in the studio. Oops. This is a full color photograph of her that was for a full color celebrity paper feature. She appeared with like eight other celebrities, but we have the glass negative of this as well. This is an early picture of her um, doing ballet. I guess 1919 or so. I think this was this was taken in Chicago, so I'm pretty sure it's her in the Chicago ballet. This is a picture of her and her first husband, William Austin. This is two pictures from my favorite photo set. She had many professional photo sets taken, uh, nicknamed the Frightened Photo Set, because she's making frightening, pic like frightened looking faces in all of them. And I'm pretty sure she was trying out for like a horror movie, and she needed to show that she could look scary. And I like this one because her mouth is open so wide you can see her fillings. My last picture is of her and J. Edgar Hoover. And we're not quite sure how she knew him, but it is signed by him. She's right there. Yeah, and we have several other J. Edgar Hoover uh, items, one of which is this giant target. And it has a bunch of bullet holes in it. And we think Irene shot it herself because it's not a very good shot, and we think Jennifer Hoover would have been a better shot than that. But it's signed by him at the bottom, and it says, to Miss Irene Delroy, a certainly qualified G woman. So we're not quite sure when that happened or why it happened, but she did seem to know Jennifer Hoover. Uh, one small comment on Tom Patricola, which was, quote unquote, her first love, and the woman, or the man, I'm sorry, that she wanted to marry originally. Um, her father Royal had many rants on Tom and how he felt that uh, he was the devil and couldn't believe that she was associating herself with beads of his nature. And I just want to read a small excerpt from one of his rants, and this is the end part after going on about Tom. In conclusion, promise me that you will never marry a Catholic or a Jew, and I will keep my, I will keep my peace and say nothing if you marry the devil himself. So, the devil himself being Tom Patricola, Patricola because he was both Irish and Catholic. One of his many anti-Catholic, anti-Semitic rants that the devil had throughout his, throughout his correspondence with Joseph Mandela. Um, uh, consider some questions here. Uh, what kind of woman do you feel the devil was? I'm sorry, no, but Joseph is more Irene Delos. Uh, I'd say she was very driven. Um, I wouldn't say she was uppity or anything like that. She seemed pretty level-headed and pretty uh, reasonable about her career. 
She never did anything very extreme about it. She was sort of reformed and had contracts. And just, I see her as a career woman. She was very talented, there's no question about that. Um, she had she had no trouble finding work from when she was up in Chicago all the way through her marriage uh, to William Austin Jr. And um, I feel like through reading some of her letters, she matured very quickly and she was forced to. She was thrown into the New York scene at the age of 21. Um, I know she had her mother there, but it's a completely different environment than you'd find here in Bloomington Normal, especially in the early 1900s. Um, but I feel like she was very talented, but also very grounded as well. She never um, spoke or wrote like she was any better than anyone else. And so I think um, she was a wonderful woman and did many great things, especially seen in her um, dedication to the veterans' hospitals that she, I think she did some 20 years of service for World War I and beyond. Uh, how about her relationship with her mother and father? She adored her mother. Um. They, I think they were pretty devoted to each other. I mean, Della had her other child die, so uh, Irene's pretty much all they had. And she spent several years just with her mother, and I don't think they thought very much. I, uh, I uh, had to read through the less glamorous side of her mother's relationship with Irene and her father, Royal. Uh, there was plenty of conflict there. Mm -hmm. Much of the discussion is about money. Royal worked a job where he sent half of his money out east to, to help Della and Irene get settled, but yet the payments continued from 1921 all the way through 1931 until Josephine herself was married. So there were plenty of, uh, plenty of arguments over money and stocks. Um, like Royal, uh, like I pointed out earlier, Royal never seemed to enjoy the people that Josephine was hanging out with and felt that the money that they were earning should have been plenty to support themselves, but yet um, you can see in many of his letters that he was very depressed over the fact that he was not surrounded by family during the holidays and also was supporting um, them still, even though they made probably much more money than he did. So oh, sure. So there's definitely tensions between, the two, mm -hmm. between all three of them. You can tell in their letters. I think Irene definitely took Della's side, Della took Irene's side. They felt that they were, they needed the money, but I think Royal really felt that they were spending their money without thinking um, for codes. And, well, the New York nightlife is, does not come cheap. No. I'm sure it didn't come cheap back then, but I think Royal working off a salary of like, it was like $300 a month, and you know, he's sending 150 of it out east. Wow. So, not ignoring that. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a, but unfortunately, we only mostly have letters that Royal wrote himself. We don't a lot of what Della had to say, but there were many, many letters of them fighting back and mm -hmm. forth. Um, Royal felt that Della critiqued him too much, and <laughs> Della believed that Royal was a monster, so unfortunately we don't have enough letters from both to really have a true appreciation for what the relationship was like. It could have been a beautiful relationship when they were together, but unfortunately all we have are the bad letters. <laughs> but, uh, we talked about stocks a lot, though. Yeah. I, they would do is he would invest their money for them and try to do the best he could, but I think they spent it quicker than uh, he could really do much with it. Well, going through her legal papers, she seemed to have a bit of a knack for picking dead stocks, so <laughs> I'm curious if Royal was also yeah. good at picking out film Royal, Royal companies. <laughs> Royal, yeah, he moved around a lot and he never talked of success as a salesman. He only mm -hmm. talked of failure and tough times. But you have to remember the time period. We had the Great Depression, and um, especially with uh, William Austin and his his real realtor status after the Great Depression. I can't imagine he was having. I'm sure that's why he no. ran into so much trouble. He didn't have the. No, reading through the divorce papers, um, when they divorced. He owed her quite a bit of money, and I think she tried to get it back, but then she just sort of walked away from it because she didn't want to mess with him. Yeah, I, uh, I don't know if we can question whether it was for love or money, but I, don't, I, I think that kind of pays testament that it wasn't for money because he didn't have much at the end. They seemed to stick together through the tough, through the good times and the bad, but I think it just became overwhelming. Well, I've read, a, I've read her letters to her lawyer, and uh, she basically just accuses him of abandonment, and 
she says that she was paying most of the expenses towards the end of their effective marriage. So, so maybe she married for love, but he married yeah. for money. I don't know. <laughs> but I think he fully planned on the rich part. <laughs> yeah. But I think, uh, I think the main thing is the stress on the family. I think it's a, being the only child, I think they both loved her very much and wanted to see her succeed. But I think they both, or at least, especially Roy, I'm not sure. Della did not agree with Tom as well. There were a couple letters about they wanted to direct uh, Irene's life choices, but yeah. I think uh, Irene was forced to grow up pretty quickly. and She felt like she knew what was best for her. So I think that's where a lot of the tension stemmed from. Anything else you, you uh, found interesting? Or more um, I can't think of anything. You want to talk about her stalker? Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, in addition, she well, she stalker or stalkers. She had plenty of uh, plenty of fan letters from the state penitentiary all over uh, the United States. Uh, one particular one was uh, was quite descriptive in um, what he wanted to do with her and uh, how much that how much he adored her and heavenly things about her. He he was a uh, was a bit. There's a reason he was probably in the penitentiary. She was also, I don't know if I told you that, but there was an article published in the New York newspaper about how um, a person posing as a taxi driver had uh, Irene and I believe her mother get into the car and uh, he would not stop at the, the location that they had requested and kept driving and it turns out this was just a man who was a big fan of Irene's that uh, was posing as a cab driver. Wanted, just wanted to go out to dinner or something like that. Unfortunately, in the New York traffic, they got to a stoplight and they were able to get out. But that was another thing that was uh, highly publicized in the New York newspapers there. Wow. <laughs> she, <laughs> definitely, yeah, she definitely did not live a boring life. Um, I think uh, New York City compared to Wilmington, Illinois. Is, uh, I think it's a fantasy for many people that live in it. Her ups and downs of her career, and the people she ran into, really. Roy wanted uh, this hometown girl that was going to be educated. And what he got was a daughter who uh, was in the spotlight her whole life, and I don't think she turned out like he wanted, but still loved her. You can tell at the, at the end of the, both Della and Royal's life, Josephine was there for both of them. And there was definitely a, a love there, especially after Della left, or Della died. Yeah. Um, there was kind of a break in letters you can say between Irene and Royal, but when they lost Della, um, the letters picked up considerably, and there's hundreds of letters between um, the four or five years Royal was alive after Della that um, they're a lot more heartfelt and I think more understanding of each other. She, he finally accepted her as a woman who could make her own decisions, and she was willing to forgive all that had happened in the past and love her father while she still had him. So. There's some touching things in there too. It's mostly during the beginning of her career that it was, it was some banter back and forth. Mm -hmm. But the loss of a mother, I think, brought them together.